Hello and welcome to episode 65 of Foreign Correspondence, a podcast that brings you interviews with journalists around the world. I'm Jake Spring, a foreign correspondent with 10 years experience in Brazil and China. I'm thrilled to have gotten an opportunity to speak to this month's guest, Ian Urbina. Ian was a longtime journalist for the New York Times and now runs a journalism nonprofit called the Outlaw Ocean Project. I first heard about him way back in episode 26 of the podcast when I spoke to freelance photographer Laurel Chor. Laurel recommended Ian's book called The Outlaw Ocean about lawlessness at sea. Now, I've gotten a lot of book recommendations on the podcast, but this was the first one I actually went on to read myself. I've been fascinated by life and research at sea since I took an oceanography class in college, so I was hooked immediately just by the description. It's really an astounding book in how many different angles Ian finds to report on lawlessness on the ocean, and I recommend anyone interested check it out. I think at the time I posted something on Twitter about liking the book, and Ian responded positively, so I filed it away in the back of my brain that it would be good to interview him for the podcast at some point. Flash forward to when I won an Overseas Press Club award earlier this year, and looking through the other winners, there was Ian again, winning an award for a piece he wrote for The New Yorker. So I reached out to him, and here we are. This is one of my shorter interviews, but man, is it jam-packed with fascinating stuff. Before Ian started writing about crime at sea, he wrote articles that served as the basis for not one but two major Hollywood movies, American Honey about traveling magazine sales crews and Promised Land about fracking. He also was part of the team of reporters at the New York Times who won a Pulitzer Prize for exposing the prostitution scandal involving former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer. He'll tell us all a little bit about those stories. Then we'll talk about his years-long dedication to reporting on oceans and his latest piece for The New Yorker called The Secretive Prisons Keeping Migrants Out of Europe. While reporting on that piece, Ian, along with his reporting team, were beaten and detained by the Libyan Intelligence Service. I was impressed by his candid answers about that experience and also about the use of bylines and how journalists are credited or not credited for their work. I was really impressed by Ian's thoughtfulness in taking on those tough questions, so don't miss those parts of the interview. I could say a lot more, but better you hear for yourselves. Here's my conversation with Ian Urbina, a journalist who leads the Outlaw Ocean Project. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Ian. My pleasure. And before we get into it, could you just set the scene and tell us where you're speaking to us from? I'm speaking to you from Washington, D.C., which is where I was born and raised and where I live now. Okay. And yeah, that's the next place we'll go. I am ask all my guests to tell me where they're from and a little bit about what growing up was like and if anything planted the seed of interest in journalism or the ocean or anything you do now early on when you were a kid. So I'm from Washington, D.C., and I grew up here in the city in a time when the city was the murder capital of the world and a pretty broken place. We reelected a mayor who was caught on camera smoking crack and the crime rate was through the ceiling and the murder rate was globally renowned. My father's black, my mom's white, and um, my father was a federal judge in Washington, D.C. And I think that's relevant just because as you know, a biracial native of the city, I sort of had an insider-outsider perspective on a, a city that's really very divided racially and, and in terms of class. And I think that's relevant journalistically just because it gave me a core sense of otherness, you know, always feeling like I could pass for lots of different things, but always having a, a bit of a stepped back perspective, like a good reporter should from everything you're watching. You know, and I, I went to a private boys school, very, a really great school called St. Albans School. And then I uh, went away to college, but ultimately came back and ended up doing the remainder of my undergraduate degree at Georgetown University. So a lot of years spent in the city. Mm -hmm. did, you do, did you do any student journalism or anything like that? Or when did you first get interested in journalism? I did not. I liked writing, but that's as far as it went. I wasn't part of the yearbook in high school or the student newspaper what I did do is, as an undergraduate, I got involved with an investigative journalist as his researcher minion, a guy named Ken Silverstein, 
who is a pretty famous muckraking investigative journalist. He was at AP in Brazil, Brazil bureau chief for a long time. Then he came back to the U.S. and began doing freelance stuff. And I, I worked for him as I was an undergrad. And I got exposure to the the gore and the beauty of, of journalism. <laughs> and uh, then I went off to grad school and went into a doctoral program at the University of Chicago, which was a history, anthrop- cultural anthropology program, and worked uh, my way through that program. And only on my fifth year of doing doctoral work, I worked on Cuba, did I start revisiting the notion of journalism as perhaps a better fit for me than the academy. And the reasons for that were, I really liked the life of the mind that the academy offered, but I I was more attracted to the output of the intellectual labor being one that felt like it had more of an impact on the world and was consumed by more people. And I thought that I, the academic path would not necessarily offer me that as much as journalism did. And so I jumped ship from my doctoral work and, and got a job at the New York Times. You make it sound so easy. How, how does one jump out of their doctoral program to the New York Times? It, yeah, it's not easy. It's a lot of luck. Uh, my timing was very serendipitous. So the slow motion version of that story is I was losing speed on my dissertation. I had done a full year living in Havana as a Fulbright fellow, and I was loving the place, but loving my topic less and less. And so I decided to start writing freelance for magazines. And I began writing on the Middle East because I had written one piece that got noticed by a think tank that worked on the Middle East. And they said, would you come write for us? regularly. And I said, I don't speak Arabic. I don't speak Hebrew. And I don't know very much at all about the Middle East. I work on Latin America. (laughs) And they said, all the better. You know, you know how to write. And we have reams of professors who don't necessarily know how to write for the public audience. And so it'll be a good match. So I spent the next two years writing on the Middle East, quite especially on the Arab-Israeli conflict. What what was the magazine? Uh, Middle East Report. It's what it's, the magazine was called, and the think tank is called Middle East Research and Information Project. It's sort of an offspring of the Middle East Studies Association, which is a bunch of academics that work on these issues, and this is the sort of thing arm of them. So I spent two years funded, subsidized writing pieces, mostly for the Sunday sort of outlook section or review section or op-ed pages about various issues in the Middle East. And that sort of taught me how to write for a lay audience. And I did some field reporting. I spent some time during the first Antifada in the West Bank and got really captured by the journalistic experience. And so when the funding dried up after two years, I was at a Falcon Road. And that's when I had to either decide to jump full back into the academic path or go full on in the journalism path. And so I chose to apply everywhere under the sun in journalism. And I applied to the New York Times and AP and everyone and the New York Times and the Washington Post and 60 Minutes were the only place that would give me an interview. And I think it was just because I was an oddball candidate with no prior traditional experience, no journalism school, but I brought other things to the table that interested them. And I think those are big enough institutions that can take risks on duck build platypi like myself, you know, and, um, sure. and the, and the times said, okay, we'll learn, we'll teach you how to write breaking stories and hard news stories and write fast. You already know how to write long and analytically. Mm-hmm. And the, I, I took the job at the times. What was the job or the beat or the position? Brutal is what it was. It was <laughs> the entrance in the New York times uh, at that time. And still to this day, if you think of it as a teaching hospital, there are really a couple of floors where they have the staff and the patients and the real estate to handle unfinished folk like myself. And that's the business page and the Metro page. And sometimes the sports desk, those are the three on ramps. I don't know anything about sports. So that wasn't the right move. I was not (laughs) interested in business reporting. So Metro was where I was ramped. 
I was an 8I, which is this program where they essentially give you all the responsibilities and the pay like a normal reporter, but not the union contract. So you don't have jobs, sort of probationary, and they try you out for a year. And so I was 8I on Metro, and I was covering cops and fires and just the breaking news stuff, and it was absolute misery, and I was in over my head, and I had no idea what I was doing, but I had incredible editors who taught me how to do it. I did that for a couple of years and bumped out of 8i, and then I went to the national desk and became the Mid-Atlantic Bureau Chief, and then I was bumped into investigative, and from there I was doing pure investigative the rest of my career. Sure, sure. I mean, is there anything that happened during your time as Mid-Atlantic Bureau Chief that was investigative that put you in that direction? Yeah, I mean, um, I always wanted to be Seymour Hirsch. You know, I, th- th- that was my aspiration. That's the kind of journalism I wanted to do. And so I was always hankering to do longer form investigative type stories. And I usually would have some side passion project that I was working on apart from putting out the fires of daily news. Mid-Atlantic means you, there are eight states that really run from Kentucky, as defined by the Times Bureau, you know, from Kentucky up to Ohio, that geography is yours. So there's always some senator who's just got caught doing this or some, <laughs> you know, in my tenure, it was all coal mine disasters and school shootings. It was like every other month there was one or the other. And so I did a lot on those. Virginia Tech happened, all the Sago, Aracoma, all the big coal mining disasters happened that time. I really liked West Virginia and Appalachia in, in, in general, you know, just sort of like invisible white poverty to a large degree, I thought was like really the kinds of stories and demographic I wanted to focus on, just invisible demographics. So I did a, a fair amount of investigative on the coal mining stuff, for example. And then, you know, I had oddball things. I did a, a piece about teen runaways and sex trafficking of minors while I was on that beat and I did something on what was another mag cruise. It became a movie. Um, American Hunt, uh, was based on that reporting, but it was about these kids that get in this weird kind of Ponzi like racket where they're traveling door to door around the country, selling magazine subscriptions and this underworld of this kind of work and just how screwed up it was. And I did a long investigation of that. So I, I got my, I got my chances to do things that I really, really liked aside from just the breaking news stuff. And eventually editors saw that I might be better off just doing that stuff. Sure. Yeah. No, American honey is a great movie. I liked it a lot. I didn't realize uh, it was based on reporting. So did you ask to be moved to investigative? Did they pull you in? Is it, are all the moves uh, editors saying, Hmm, maybe in would fit in here well, or was it your pushing them? It was my pushing often the moment when you have the ability to raise these questions or when you're moving from one desk to another or when your desk is taken over by a new editor and they're having conversations with the existing staff about what would you like to do under my reign. And those are key moments when you can actually do big things. And so when I moved from Metro to the national desk, I said, look, I'm happy to do mid-Atlantic beat coverage that is needed in this job, but I do want to lean towards longer form, slower brew, deeper dive stuff. And I think I'll make the paper proud if you give me the time to do that, you know, series, not just dailies. And I got some initial loosening of the leash in that jump. And then the next big reckoning or moment was when a new editor took over the national desk, oh, I was actually at that moment flirting with the foreign desk and the new editor knew and said, look, what would it take to keep you with us? And I said, make me pure investigative where I can just find good targets. And they said, done. This editor said done. And he's a good friend. He's the guy who founded STAT, uh, Rick Burke. And um, he was the editor of the national desk. And he said, great. And he teamed me up with this amazing editor who's one of my best friends now. He's since left the paper, Adam Bryant. And he said, you and Adam cook up what you want. And so Rick really let me off the leash. And Adam and I cooked up this series called Drilling Down, which was a deep and hard hitting look at fracking. And this was before this was a popular target. 
And so we did uh, this very controversial, aggressive series on concerns about fracking. And that also became the Matt Damon, John Krasinski movie, Promised Land. But more importantly, that series had huge repercussions in, in the fracking market and in the whole scene. And that was the first big investigative project that I ever was allowed to do. And from there, you know, I just kept doing them. Yeah. Wow. So this was 2000s, 2010s or when, when abouts was this? I think Drilling Down was 2011. It ran that whole year, 2011. We started in 2010. I think it published all 2011. Okay. So, I mean, that that's not that long ago. And, you know, people think of you as the, the outlaw ocean guy, but uh, was there already some early interest in oceans in this or, or how do you get from there to oceans? Well, you jump back in time first and you look at this cold winter in south side of Chicago and Hyde Park where I was bumming hard and really just kind of slogging through my dissertation and looking for either a way to give up on it or take a break from it. And I met this incoming doctoral student who's now a professor of hackers, interesting woman named Biela Coleman. And she was coming into the program at the University of Chicago and she had just come off of this ship and she had spent a year or so working on this ship called the RV Heraclitus. And this is this ship that did research and stuff. Um, it was sort of a spinoff of Biosphere and it was their at sea portion and they did research and they took random folks from all over the world that wanted to spend a year at sea and, and work. And Biela had worked on this ship and told me about her experience. And I thought, wow, that sounds amazing. I wonder if they would take me on for like three months or six months and I could take a leave from my dissertation and go to sea just because it felt so different and so refreshing. And so I reached out to them. They said, yes. I talked to my committee and said, hey, I need to put a pin in it for three, six months. They said, okay. I went, I jumped a plane, went to Singapore, got on this ship, and we never left port. <laughs> and for three months there, got hung up by paperwork issues and all sorts of com complexities. But I was stuck on this ship with really interesting people, spending a lot of time in this bizarre port called Rapids Marina, and talking to a lot of seafarers of all sorts of different types from People, in retrospect, I'm pretty sure were trafficked, you know, Cambodian deckhands on fishing vessels to Geraldo Rivera's super yacht that was manned by a bunch of Kiwis who were cooling their heels until the phone call came in that he wanted his boat over in the Caribbean. And so a really diverse demographic set of guys, because it's a very male world. And I just became fascinated by their stories and what they had gone through and just the world they lived in. And that, like, you know, I was running away from anthropology and I backed my way into, you know, a new tribe, you know, if you will, of folks that I was fascinated by. And so I, after three months, I said, look, this boat's never leaving port. So I'm going to go back home and get back to the real world. And so I did that. And then that exposure to seafarers in general and the curiosity about them stuck in the back of my head. So then a decade later, when I sat down with my editor and she sprung on me the question about like, okay, well, good job on that last thing you just did. What's your next target? And I wasn't prepared. I just shot a Hail Mary and said like, hey, like if you really want to know what I think would be an incredible series, if we put risk and time and cost aside, like I think there are amazing stories out there at sea that um, are way beyond what people think of when they think of ocean mayhem which is typically Captain Phillips' Somali piracy or the BP spill or plastic pollution. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot more going on out there. And if you let me add it, I bet you I could land some really big game, you know, from story perspective. And what's interesting is this editor, her name is Rebecca Corbett. She was for many years at the Baltimore Sun and she was David Simon from The Wire's editor. And she's, you know, she, she's this sort of famous editor wow. in the profession. And she oversaw a Pulitzer winning project at the sun about actually a season in the wire, um, but about, you know, the seediness and the complexities of the port in Baltimore. And if you watch the wire, if you're a devotee, then, you know, there's a whole season about that. And that's based on Baltimore sun reporting that Corbett was the Rebecca Corbett was the editor over and these really great Baltimore sun reporters landed the Pulitzer for it. 
So Rebecca, my editor at the Times, knew what I was saying was true, that there's just this incredible, seedy, interesting world out there that isn't known by the public at large. So anyway, she said she greenlit me to write a memo, you know, with a bunch of story ideas, and she sort of ushered it up to Dean Bacay, and he said, yeah, this sounds interesting, and he whittled my 15 story ideas down to, like, let's start with these three, <laughs> you know, and let's do a three-part series, and they sent me out. I did the first three, and that was going to be it, a three-part series. We published them. It got a really strong reaction, and Dean said, send them back out, and we cooked up three more, and that's how it all began. Wow. What, what year was that? That was 2015. 2014 was when we started reporting, and 2015 is when we published um, the bulk of the series. It was six It was six or seven pieces in the paper and then one magazine piece. And just uh, to give us a sense of, I, I've read your recent New Yorker piece. I've read your book. I can't say I've read the whole back catalog. How did you lead off that series? And I guess just give us a little bit of taste of how you went about it. Yeah, I mean, so the the series just conceptually had a couple of agendas. One was let's report these stories as human stories, not environmental stories first, because historically the ocean is journalistically approached as an environmental story and more than 50 million people work out there. And so we wanted to sort of really focus on interesting and worrisome and heroic or just odd behavior of humans out there. Secondly, the stories were meant to establish a sort of lengthening of the spectrum of the taxonomy, if you will, of characters and behavior out there. So that if people thought, oh, I know what maritime crime looks like, we wanted to say, oh, but you don't. You know, there's sea slavery, arms trafficking, murder on camera, intentional dumping of oil, illegal fishing, overfishing, repo men who are paid by banks to steal ships, enslavement, you know, there's a, a, a real plethora that's beyond what you actually recognize. So if we're going to select the stories, we should select them with an aim towards diversity, not commonality. And the commonality is the space and also approaching the space as a frontier, thinking of it first and foremost as this sprawling zone that has this definitional legal kind of existence that is unlike on land historically it's a metaphor for freedom a place of escape legally it's a gray area owned by everyone and no one for which there's no actual police force that patrols what few laws there are human wise it's a bunch of people who go out there and exist in this living and working space where the hierarchies are not like they are on land if you go and work at a factory the head guy is the boss if you go and work on a ship the head guy is god the captain of the ship is not is not just a boss. They have a transcendental authority over you. So really leaning into setting this space as distinct and diverse and then populating that ambition, that sort of reimagining with a bunch of stories that prove it, you know, that show it. That, that was the hope I had for what the body of reporting would do. Stage one. Stage one was the paper. Stage two was the book. And stage three is our nonprofit now. And each stage has the same ambition, but on a larger scale. And the first story, you know, was the initial story that we planted in the time series was a story that looked at a ship called the Donna Liberta. And it was a ship that was representative of an array of crime. It was a great candidate. to. We were going to take a ship and make it the main character. And we wanted the ship to be a main character that showed bad behavior in multiple forms. The Don Alberto was great because it had three pretty striking categories to its name. One was the problem of intentional dumping. A lot of people think, oh, well, oil spills are the big problem of pollution at sea. And these are accidental dumpings, right? But actually, more oil is intentionally dumped by ships every three years on average, than the BP and the Exxon Valdez spills combined. And that rarely gets attention. And it's largely by way of something called a magic pipe, which is just a flushing mechanism mechanism that ships can use to dump discreetly dump their oily wastewater. And so we wanted to sort of like find a way to tell that story in a non-wonky fashion. Donald Liberta did it. We had evidence of it. And so check one. 
Don Liberto also had this second component, which was post 9-11, there was a real worry about the trickle down effect of post 9-11 policies in ports where they criminalized stowaways to a higher degree. And the result was the financial penalties that would be levied on a captain if they showed up at port with uninvited guests, stowaways on board, were way more severe because of all the anti-terrorism fears and such. And so we were hearing reports of stowaways being killed, thrown overboard, or rafted, meaning put on a raft and cut loose and sort of, we don't want to kill you, but we can't come into port with you on board, so we're going to put you on a raft, and that's rafting. Don Liberta had done that, and we had found proof of it, and we'd even found the stowaways who had been rafted by these guys. So that was check two. And then the third category, what was the third? Oh, a seafarer abandonment. So a huge global problem where ship owners realize they're in the red or they've, they've got some litigation against them or the ship breaks down, the piece costs too much or whatever, new regs come in and it just doesn't make sense to keep that ship hobbling along. And so they decide to cut their losses and literally overnight they just disappear and they stop answering calls from the ship and they declare bankruptcy and they step away. And what happens to the guys on board is that they're stuck. You know, they're like literally floating out there. They don't have papers that allow them to get off in port and go home. They don't have fuel or funding to, to drive the ship home. And so they're really in a bind. And if they do anything unilaterally without permission from the bosses, they may get blacklisted and never be able to work again. And that had happened to the Don Alberta, to the crew of the Don Alberta. So we had three categories of misbehavior all summed up in this one ship. So we just told the story of that one ship and how it became such a bad actor and what it was illustrative of. And I, I mean, all those sound familiar from your book. It sounds like it made it into the book also then. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm curious, when did the book, was the book always a plan or was it after the series came out, you saw the reaction and you thought, oh, let's, I'm going to go write a book? The latter. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't. Um, book leaves were very unpopular at the time. <laughs> I never assumed that if I asked for a book leave, that I would get it and have a job waiting for me when I got back. So I never thought about a book. But then the series ran and there was interest from Netflix and Leo DiCaprio. And there was this discussion about purchasing the rights to make something, but they would need more content and a book would give them enough content, but the series wouldn't. And so my thought was, I really like the line of reporting. I feel like I've got a good head of steam. There are a bunch of stories I haven't even gotten to. And there's a waiting set of partners who are eager to do stuff with it. So it just felt like one of those life decisions where it's like, it's now or never. And so I asked Dean Bacay for permission to take this lead. And he very generously, as he did throughout my career, said, okay, you know, it's not great for them because he's got to keep that seat open for me. And it took me two years. Uh, so that's a long time to be down a player, but um, he generously gave me the time. Yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, how quickly things change. I feel like now book leave is such a extremely common thing. Um, before we push on too much, I, I forgot you uh, won a Pulitzer, but for something completely unrelated, uh, for the Elliot Spitzer story. How was that when you were Mid Atlantic bureau chief, and how did you end up breaking a story about New York? Well, to, to be clear, that was not awarded to me. I was on a team, and sort of not even the most important player. There were four of us on the team, and the lead guy on that team is this famous reporter at the New York Times named Willie Rashbaum. And he's been the police bureau reporter for, you know, four decades, I think. <laughs> and he's an amazing reporter. He's still there. I just had drinks with him a couple weeks ago up in New York. And um, yeah, Willie broke that story unilaterally and exclusively and found out that a client number nine, I think it was, anonymous client was a big fish who had been netted in a pretty run-of-the-mill prostitution sting. And um, Willie ferreted out that the big fish was the governor, or was he then the AG? And so I was called in because I was 
not on the Metro desk then, this was a Metro story and the team had been built around Willie, Willie, uh, Danny Hakem, Serge Kovalesi. Those were the three main reporters on Metro. I was based in DC and I, I had left and the two editors, Joe Sexton, who actually came to work for me and was with me in Libya when we were taken, and a guy named Kevin Flynn, who's still at the New York Times. Those two guys were the editors of this Spitzer team. And no one, there was a very tight confidentiality seal around what had been discovered. Um, Jill Abramson was the editor at the time, and she had said, like, look, it's on a need-to-know basis only. And so I got a call from Joe Sexton and Kevin Flynn, who were my former editors, and they were great guys, and they were like, hey, look, you have done this. We're interested. A, A, we know you, and we know you're really scrappy. B, you've done a lot of work in the prostitution realm because you, I did this series on sex work of minors, and so I had become pretty adept at the call girl. There, there's, there's a whole internet universe where Johns report on prostitutes in this insanely detailed way, hmm. and I had learned how to work with this organization called NICMIC, which is a missing persons organization. Um, they had taught me how they often find underage sex workers and rescue them. Anyway, so Sexton and Flynn called me and said, we've got something, we can't tell you much about it, but we need to see if you're interested in stepping off of the national desk and working for me. We've already gotten permission from your boss at the national desk, but we need you to say you're all in or not, because if you're all in, you're launching tonight. And I was like, okay, what's the story? And they said, we can't tell you. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, okay, so you just need me to, I said, I said, okay, fine. Let me get coverage for my kid. Let me call my mom and make sure I can free myself up. How long do I need to free myself up for? And they're like, oh, it's about a week. And I, Sexton is this guy who's prone to pranks and such. And Flynn is a much straighter shooter. And I said, Kev, this is weird. Is Sexton gaming me? Because they were both on speakerphone. And he said, Ian, you'll want in on this story. And I said, okay, that's all I need to hear. So I got coverage for my kid. I called back and they told me, they brought me in. And I was like, whoa, wow, okay, what do you need me to do? They needed someone to go work a bunch of DC angles. The Mayflower Hotel in particular in DC, try to get the clerk to verify a certain credit card number. And the driver who used to take Spitzer around, we had an address for him. They needed someone to go work that guy, talk his door, knock on his door middle of the night and lean on him to talk to me. And and so that's what I was brought in to do, and that's what I did. And I had good luck, and so I was able to stay on the team. And, and ultimately, we broke the story, and the paper, the team, won the Pulitzer for it. And uh, that's what that's about. Yeah, wow. That's a very cool story. And I guess you t- mentioned a lot of the stuff you've done has been made into films or been optioned. Do you see any of that money or no? So it depends. So... The way that works, well, again, I've been out of the Times for a while now, so I think this may have changed. When I was there, if you're a staff writer for the Times, then you would get a bonus, not a percentage, on the sale for the reporting. But really, the Times owns the reporting, as well they should. You know, they're paying you a salary and what you produce, the intellectual property, really belongs to them. And if they want to leverage it and sell it to a secondary market like a movie, then they get to pocket it. At the same time, historically, the divides have been pretty unbalanced. And more importantly, the amount of input in even the negotiation, much less the creation of what comes out, the reporter's been like completely shut out. That has changed from what I hear from colleagues now a lot. And reporters get a bigger payment of some sort, whether it's a percentage or a flat fee. And they're often allowed to be involved a little bit more in things. But at the end of the day, the outlaw ocean was different. That's one of the reasons why the discussion shifted to the book, quite frankly. Because Netflix and DiCaprio said, we will option the book and you own the book. So if you go back out and report for two more years and you incorporate but build on and make a new, the original series, but you do all this new reporting, then we'll option the book and that'll be a relationship between us and you directly. And that changes the game plan and you'll be very involved. 
And my agent, who's a really good agent, Chrissy Fletcher, um, negotiated that being the deal, and it made a lot of sense. And now whenever I get calls a lot from current and times people who are like, hey, we've heard that you've been through this a bunch of times when you were on staff at the Times. Do you have any advice for me? I say, yes, I do. You know, like, here's how you should do it so that you have the upper hand in controlling the negotiation over how that goes. Sometimes you don't have the option to write a book. You don't have the time. You don't have the material. You don't have the interest. And if it's just optioning the material that appeared in the paper, then you're limited as to what you can do. But if you can think of a different type of deal, then you can exert a lot more control over it. And that's what we did here with the Yellow Ocean. But the American Honey, I was hired as a consultant for American Honey, largely because the director, Andrea Arnold, plugged into me personally. And she was like, we became friends. And I actually gave her a lot of counsel on what mag crew kids to interview so that she could do the movie. And that was a great relationship. And I had a great intellectual relationship with that cast and that reporting that that movie because the director decided it but drilling that you know the other things that have been optioned I never even heard from them it was like beyond my reach and I was never contacted and that's fine mm -hmm. that yeah it's super fascinating how this stuff uh, goes down even if it's kind of nitty-gritty you know journalism industry stuff just one quick follow-up will we be seeing an outlaw ocean movie soon <laughs> if ever no or like Soon, I doubt soon. <laughs> L.A. Um, is a opaque place that I still can't see into properly, but there's still work happening on that. It's not dead in the water, but it's incredibly slow moving and utterly outside my control. But they are moving in the direction of some sort of movie plan, but it, partially because of the nature of filming on the water and making something as big as they seem to want to it's taking forever, but I, I, I really don't, um, I'm very uninvolved in that front sure. for better or for worse. Sure. And then why leave the times and start this nonprofit? I love the times because I love the times. The times was an amazing blessing for me and taught me everything I know. I left there because I wanted number one to stay with this one focus area. And I knew that I was going to be forced to start looking at other topics and I didn't want to do that. Number two, I wanted to experiment with with innovation and distribution and trying to use art and and other types of platforms to try to get younger and more diverse people to consume the news that I was producing. And I didn't think I was going to be able to do that within the confines of the times. And I also was spoiled by two years on book leave and realized that I quite enjoyed having a team around me and a, and a sort of shared mode of reporting. And I thought I could produce better journalism if I had more control over the team who was selected, the timetable of it, and, and the production of the content. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Next, I think I'll move on to the New Yorker piece, um, which recently won the Overseas Press Club Award, which is how it came to my attention and why I asked to, to interview you, having already been a fan of the book. I mean, the piece, it's really an extremely strong piece of journalism, and I'll put a link up to it. People should go check it out. But just to pick out a couple things, tougher questions to ask, maybe. I mean, towards the end, you reveal that, you know, you get imprisoned, you get um, the the security forces or whatever you want to call them, take your team into custody, hold you for several days and you know it sounds like quite a harrowing experience that I, I i'm not sure maybe you've never experienced otherwise in your career but i was just wondering you know as many people kind of push the limits and i have a lot of colleagues going to ukraine you know a lot of people ask themselves how far is it worth it to go and i'm just curious if looking back at that you think differently now that you've been through an experience like that well, let me ease into the, the answer because I, it's formulating itself in my head. I think easier ones are there's a precedent, for better or for worse, of being on that edge. So in Somalia, Fabio and I got in a similarly tough bind where we were trapped and it was real, you know, touch and go as to whether we were going to get captured or not. So this was not the first time that that I had been through this. It was a small. It was just. It was just. Fabio and I, so it was a smaller team 
and we didn't get taken captive. We hid out and then escaped through um, mm -hmm. some luck. Now, to your question, Libya, this was unlike anything I'd experienced. The violence that was visited upon me at the initial capture, there was a very severe beating that happened at the hotel where they hooded me and bagged me up pretty good for a while and broke some ribs and did some internal damage and mm -hmm. before they dragged me to this place. And then the captivity and just how close it was to not ending well, the sort of harm that that did mentally is something I don't know I've processed fully, frankly. Uh, we got out and the three others who were with me, Maya Doles, a doc filmmaker, Pierre Qatar, videographer on my staff, and Joe Sexton, my editor, everyone is now doing okay, to, to well even. But I guess what I would say is, I, I wanna be really careful in saying this because I think it could be disrespectful of the trauma that the others experienced. But, but my honest answer is, and the trauma that my loved ones experienced, my wife in particular, you know, um, because uh, it was very unclear that it, it looked like they were going to release the other three and keep me. And we were all convicted as spies because we had to sign some confessional document in Arabic that we never knew what it said. But, but it was pretty obvious on the third day of captivity that because the State Department was putting severe pressure on the president of Libya, that they were going to try to get a compromise where they got to keep me and I was the ringleader and they were going to let the other ones go. And all that is to say, like, I think, um, I do think that the story became much more powerful because of the aggressive reporting we did that got us locked up in the first place. Had we done less aggressive reporting, we wouldn't have gotten taken in custody. And had we done less aggressive reporting, we would have had a really strong story, but not even if we didn't include what happened to us as part of the story, the sheer thing, you know, we went to Gargresh, a migrant slum. We were forbidden to go visit. This is where all the migrants live. There is no journalistic or governmental reason that they should prevent us from going to a slum where migrants live, except that they're trying to cover their own ass and not allow us to talk to the very victims of their abuses. And they were saying it was to protect us completely incorrect. And had we not gone to Gargresh, we would not have opened the door to all the eyewitnesses of the crime. And, you know, that was a game changing rule breaking that we engaged in and journalistically was worth it. Had we not put a drone up over Mabani to film what's actually happening there, we probably wouldn't have gotten taken into custody. But had we not done that, no one would to this day ever have the ability to see what Mabani looks like, this prison where the migrants are kept and actually see beating happening on screen. So the risks we took in retrospect feel to me worthy, but I say that for myself only and not on behalf of my teammates. They might answer differently and say, in retrospect, I wish we hadn't done that and it wasn't worth it. But in my view, journalistically, it was, it was worth it. And I think the story benefited from crossing the lines we did. No, that makes sense. And yeah, I mean, you needed to see the prison to really, you know, describe it in depth in the article. And so that makes sense to me. One, one other thing I wanted to ask about the story is it, it references in the story, the team. And, you know, there's been quite a bit of debate on this podcast and articles about the role of foreign correspondents. And, you know, even uh, Reuters own managing editor left to go found an organization that was just written up in the Times that they want to basically do away with foreign correspondence. And beyond that, you know, there's been a lot of debate about fixers and how they're credited and things like that. So when I read, you know, my team, and then I'm like, scroll back to the top by Ian Urbina, I was just like, you know, I, I see both sides of it, but I was just curious if you have anything to, to say about that. And I mean, I don't know who your team is, if they need higher levels of protection, you know, we do that sometimes at Reuters when people sometimes can't be identified. But, you know, what's your philosophy on that, I guess? I mean, my philosophy is evolving, quite frankly, but where it is now and unabashedly is now is 
so if you look on the website, you'll see there's an article all about the players, like Joe Galvin, various players. So there are two levels of team, I think, that are important to think about. One is the, actually, there are probably three levels of team, right? There's the team, which is the four people that were on the ground in Libya. So that's me and the three people I named. And if you want to be really prudent, you would say it's a five-person team because we also put a videographer at the same time on the water in an embed on a Doctors Without Border ship for five weeks and so that we could meld the reporting and have a full coverage of the on the water and on the land. So that's one concentric circle de definition of team. Then there's an, a bigger circle, which is I have a staff of eight people, it varies to eight to 10 people who all work at the Outlaw Ocean Project. And all of them have different roles that are constantly shifting, but they all at some level contribute to the reporting. They also run the music project and the mural project and the next round of stories and all these things, but everyone does everything and they're part of that team. So that's another eight people that are there. And then outside of that, even further, is the concentric circle that includes the fixers and translators and you know drone operator who did that one thing for us in that one place and all the additional short-term subcontractors that are in that third concentric circle. All right, if you look at the outermost concentric circle of how many people make up the team, air quotes here, you're looking probably at 50 people. Wow. Okay. So if you wanted to define who did that reporting in the most accurate fashion, you'd have a list of 50. And I'm not exaggerating here. <laughs> That's how many people were involved in legitimate fashions, right? Sure. Uh, and that doesn't even include fact checkers, who are also hugely essential, of which there were six of them for The New Yorker, copy editors. Let's not even include those in, for invisible workers who are putting in work to make this finish. Okay, the, the, ed the video editors who helped take the final documentary film and make it ready for El Globo in Brazil and The Guardian, different team. Okay, so the team gets bigger and bigger. All of them are workers, intellectual workers who are laying hands on the final product. Okay, so you have to decide which concentric circle feels appropriate for crediting, right? So the single byline is a lie. It's always a lie. It never is true. There's no such thing as a true single byline because no journalism is ever produced by one person. There's always editors and, okay. The way we do it at the Times is, and if you look on the website, you'll see there's the original piece, the 10,000 word piece, and there are about 12 additional pieces that ran as spin-offs from the reporting, either reported subsequently or had already been reported, but they're deeper dives on singular topics. And you'll see other bylines like Joe Galvin popping up there. And so in, within my organization, I float certain folks up for bylines if they're doing certain things, like they're very involved in actually the reporting and the writing, then they're coming up to the byline. So, and I think actually maybe the most ethical direction to move is what The Economist does. You get rid of bylines altogether because that actually is the only way in which you can avoid having to decide what concentric circle. If you're going to keep bylines, and a lot of venues in the world, the vast majority, demand a byline. They, they won't run something that says the Outlaw Ocean Project. Then you have to figure out what makes sense in your concentric circles. And for that piece, it definitely made sense for it to be my byline because I did the writing, I did the on-the-ground reporting, and there was going to be first person in it. So those things make it pretty hard to start including folks who never laid foot in Libya, you know, folks who were editing. But that's also why we were really, really particular about having a full on article that just tells the interested public who additionally were involved in reporting and what role did they play. And so that's why we, Joe Sexton actually wrote that piece that sort of talks about what did Pierre Qatar do and Joe Galvin and Maya Doles. And, uh, but again, that doesn't get all the way out to the big concentric circle. A lot of those people are nameless and some of them have to be nameless for their own safety, but some don't. But again, where you draw the line that far out into concentric circles and when it basically becomes an exercise that makes us feel good and actually doesn't serve the public, that, that's a tougher call. But 
yeah, that's how we presently run it. I think we're moving more, as I staff up with more writers, we may move more to a place where we have co-bylines or we try to strike deals with our venues where we can maybe not use bylines at all. But I don't know that our partners, Le Monde Diplomatique, El Pais, you know, even the New Yorker are going to love the oddity of articles from us having no byline or six names on the byline. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And yeah, I had forgotten about the first person. If there were three names on there, you'd be like, who's I in this? And um, I'll I'll look up that other piece too. I I don't think I'd seen it that tells who was involved. Um, I realize we're running short on time, so I'm going to do an abbreviated version of the lightning round. Uh, So these are faster paced, I guess, you know, limit yourself to a minute or two. Do you feel ready? Yes. First off, what is the coolest, strangest, weirdest situation your job has taken you into? Uh, I'd like to classify it as a pinch me, I can't believe this is my life sort of moment, if there's one that springs to mind. Climbing on board a, a Thai fishing vessel hundreds of miles offshore, 40 trafficked Cambodian boys and men have been up for 30 straight hours and witnessing this world that they live and work in in the middle of the night as they're pulling nets and chanting and like, you know, just shocked that we've actually finally laid eyes on what we've heard described before. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, that's in your book. If uh, people want more on that, then if you had to trade places with one journalist living or dead and you would have their career, who would it be? I'm a huge fan of Luke Mogelson at The New Yorker. I actually have known Luke since before he launched his career when he was just starting. But I think he's an unusually intrepid, quiet, smart, and tireless reporter who's on the front lines of a lot of fascinating things. So I might swap in to his skin if I could. Sure. What What's his area of focus just for me and our listeners? Oh, he, he, he won... I think an OPC, he won a poll for, he wrote the piece on the, he was the, I think the only reporter in the Capitol building and got footage of the storming of the building. He's a, actually a national guardsman from New York, but so he's got, he's done a lot on Afghanistan, Iraq. He's now over in, of course, in Ukraine and he's written for them, but he, he's the guy that's in the places that are tough to get into. He's always somehow there. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then, What is the best journalistic article piece can be whatever medium, video, text, audio that you have consumed recently? Yeah, I guess I'm going to say Jennifer Senior at The Atlantic about 9-11, I think. uh, And I guess I would say Mogelson's piece about the storming of the Capitol building, the written piece, I think is probably the best piece of journalism I've read in a long time. And then... What is your favorite film, book, TV show, or other media about journalists? Can be fiction or nonfiction, just tangentially related. And please not spotlight. I've gotten that like 15 times. (laughs) But that's fine if it is. Amazing. I don't don't have an answer for that one. Let me look at my bookshelf and see if anything hops out at me. All right. Why don't I be... I would say Manufacture of Consent by Chomsky, which is a searing critique of of mainstream journalism and <laughs> but let's, let's be daring and let's say Noam Chomsky, a documentary called the manufacture of consent by Noam Chomsky. Sure. And then, Oh, what is your most embarrassing journalism related moment? If you have one. Oh, I got plenty. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's this moment when I was middling bureau chief and there's a guy, I hope Theo doesn't shoot me with this, but <laughs> he was a stringer. At the time. His name is Theo Emery. Uh, he's actually married to Audie Cornish from NPR. He's a great guy, super journalist. And he was down in West Virginia with me, and we were pulling an all-nighter, covering one of the several coal mining disasters. I can't remember if it was Sago or Aracoma. Or, but, um, and we were, we were working hard on getting a profile of one of the coal miners who had been in the mine when it collapsed. And we were about to... I think we had just filed and it was like 1.30 a.m. And um, 
Theo made a final call to someone who seemed to be a cousin of the guy just to get a final finishing quote about the loss. And the guy was like, I can't remember his name, but he was like, oh, Bubba, he's right here. And we're like, Theo was like, wait, what? He said, yeah, no, he's right here. He's with me. And we had just written this entire profile of a guy who had not died. Um, and, and everyone we talked to had somehow, you know, thought that he had died because of the way we were asking the questions and they hadn't. And it was so close to a career ending embarrassment. Wow. That, that we just evaded at the last minute. Thanks to Theo's one extra call. That was probably my most embarrassing moment. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a crazy story. And then qualifications aside, if you couldn't be a journalist, what job would you do? I think I would work for, Doctors Without Borders or Human Rights Watch, and quite especially focus on refugee camps, you know, in, in various conflict zones in the world. I feel like there's just incredible work that's done there, and it would be an intense lifestyle that feels worthy. Sure, sure. No, that's important work. So I'll just wrap up by saying... Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Ian. Thank you for having me. That's our show. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Ian Urbina, a journalist who leads the Outlaw Ocean Project. I'll post links to some of the things Ian talked about in the podcast description and also on our show page, foreignpod.podbean.com. If you like this episode of Foreign Correspondence, please subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts, and give it a rating. Beyond that, it would be a huge help if you also write a review saying what you think about the show. It helps get the podcast more attention. Follow or tweet at me on Twitter at at foreignpod. On Facebook, our page is facebook.com slash foreignpod. Above all, if you know someone who might like the podcast, please recommend it to them. The show is produced and edited by me. Our music is a track called Love Chances by Makai Beats. There's more information on that in the podcast description and on our show page. Please look for the next episode to be posted on Sunday, July 3rd. Until then, I'm Jake Spring, and this is Foreign Correspondence. Foreign Correspondence.